And welcome back. Now, John Steenhuizen is the Democratic Alliance's new leader after emerging victorious at the party's virtual elective Congress attended by more than 2,000 members at the weekend. In his acceptance speech, Steenhuizen said that he would focus the party to take power from the state and return it to the people, uh, going on to say that South Africa is uh, incapable as a state and has gotten uh, in the way of citizens getting ahead. And the newly elected leader of the DA uh, joins us now to elaborate on his vision for the party going forward. Mr. Sienazen, good morning. Welcome to Morning Live and congratulations. Good morning and great to be with you and the viewers today and thank you very much. You have, of course, been the interim leader of the Democratic Alliance, but now, of course, there has been an elective Congress and uh, your party members have overwhelming, overwhelmingly mandated you to continue on uh, this particular trajectory. How does that feel? Of course, it's great to have a mandate, and I think it was an overwhelming mandate now given to me to lead the party and to uh, lead the revival of the Democratic Alliance. Eighty percent as a result, I think that anybody would be happy with and i'm very glad that there has now been a clear majority and that um, i have now been elected by full congress uh, now the work turns to ensuring the party's battle ready for the 2021 local government elections and that's what i intend to focus my energies and attentions on uh, in, in this next uh, phase of the leadership Let's talk to exactly how you intend doing that, Mr. Steenhuizen. Uh, you speak about uh, taking power and returning it to the people. How exactly do you intend doing that? Well, I think it's first to analyze what the problems are in South Africa. And at, at the heart of nearly every problem, whether it's unemployment, whether it's low economic growth, uh, whether it's uh, travel uh, with, uh, with state-owned enterprises, there is a common denominator, and that is that the state has too much power and too much influence. What we want to do is to be able to give power back to the people by ensuring that we have a government in place that focuses like a laser beam on empowering the 30 million people who are trapped in poverty rather than the small elite. A government that is able to attract investment into South Africa uh, so that we are able to unleash a jobs revolution in the country. And a, and a government that is able to build a capable state that is actually capable of providing quality education, decent health care and safe communities. I intend to let, make sure that the DA is leading the policy debate in South Africa around how we can achieve all of these, these things. But the golden thread that runs through that is trusting the people of South Africa with power rather than the politicians at a government level who have frankly let the people of South Africa down, which is why we have a sputtering economy, why we have 13 million people in the unemployment queue and why 13 million people are living in poverty. It doesn't have to be like this. And I think there's a big space in politics for a party like the DA to set forward not just a critique of the governing party, but a compelling policy offer and uh, alternative to be able to get South Africans to lift their eyes to a new horizon of hope that I believe still beckons for South Africa. And we'll come back to poverty and unemployment, but in terms of returning power to the people of South Africa, um, beyond the policy statements, how would that practically play out? What would power to the people look like under DA rule? Well, power to the people would mean that you devolve as much as possible to local and provincial governments to be able to affect the change that are needed in those communities. International best practice shows us that when you devolve power away and you decentralize power, you're able to ensure that many, many more people have an opportunity to exercise their rights as citizens. I think that what you're able to do by unleashing people power is entrusting people to manage the economy, not the state-led economy that we've seen that has failed so many South Africans. So ensuring that we cut red tape, we unleash a wave of entrepreneurship in South Africa, that we focus the money where it should be needed, not on bailing out a failing airline, but taking that 16 billion rand and investing it in youth unemployment, in job centers, in entrepreneurship, seed capital, startup. That's how you unleash economic growth, and that's how you trust the people, by putting the money and the resources into their hands, not keeping it in the state's hands and managing it exceptionally badly. It also means taking power in many more municipalities in the next election. I believe that if there's going to be a turnaround in South Africa, it's going to start at a local government level. And that is why our party is going to be focused 
like a laser beam on ensuring that we're back already to go into the local government elections to be able to take control of many, many more municipalities across the country, to be able to bring the change to South Africans that we've seen in the other DA-run municipalities uh, where we have already been entrusted with uh, the people's votes. How exactly do you plan on doing that, uh, given the results of the last two elections uh, where you have lost some ground as the uh, Democratic Allowance? What exactly is your plan to grow the party? We didn't lose. Uh, uh, we actually had a good, good advance in the 2016 local government elections. 2019 was, uh, was a bad election for the DA. And as I said yesterday in my acceptance speech, we made mistakes. I think that we tried to be too many things to too many people. I think we were vague and unfocused. And I think many people looking at the DA at that time didn't know who we are and what we were fighting for. I also think that the party focused far too much on critiquing the ANC when what South Africans are looking for is a party that's able to say, here are our plans. We know things are bad, but here are our plans to fix them. This is how we are going to get you out of a shack and an informal settlement into a home. This is how we're going to be able to provide uh, the dignity of a job in South Africa. This is how we're going to be able to make sure that your children are receiving a quality education. And I think there's a huge space in politics for that alternative. I think people are tired of a DA that just simply shines a light to show people how deep the hole is. I think what South Africans are hungry for is a party that's shining the light to show the way out of the hole that we're in. In the environment that we're going into, the deepest economic depression in the generation caused by the lockdown, uh, many, many more people are going to join the unemployment queue. And I think there's going to be a hunger there for an alternative, a new horizon. And that's the area I want the DA to be playing in over the next year towards the local government elections. Solutions-oriented, holding government accountable, but always being able to put on the table a workable alternative that focuses on how we're going to address the myriad of problems that we're facing. Uh, one of the things, one of the resolutions that you came up with was the outlawing of CADA deployment to build a better government. So why do you believe CADA deployment is a problem? I think CADA deployment is a problem because we've now been placed in a lot of very important positions, uh, individuals who are not up to the job uh, that they've been put in. No, they've been put their base not on know-how, but on know-who. And as a result, it has crumbled service delivery. Whether it's at a local municipality where you now have very few uh, professional engineers to manage your water and electricity, uh, where at a national level where the state is being hollowed out daily by corrupt public servants who are there to enrich themselves and not to serve the interests of uh, the citizens of the country, uh, and which has led to what we call the incapable state, where the state is so compromised that it can actually no longer provide the basic services, the water and electricity, the clean accountable government, the clean audits, ensuring you're able to keep people safe. The state is stumbling on all of these, and a large part of that relies on the fact that you don't have the right people in the right jobs for the right reasons. So is that not the problem as opposed to CADA deployment? Because surely the Democratic Alliance itself, uh, where it governs in the Western Cape, would also deploy its own CADAs into specific and strategic positions. No, it is a huge problem because when you have people who are not up to the job in those positions, it compromises the ability of those departments to uh, be able to deliver. I think you must also be very careful to distinguish between political appointments within an administration, which are perfectly allowed and perfectly accepted, uh, but these are not into technical positions. They are political appointments that are linked to the term of the office bearer. You then have professional civil servant jobs that are meant to be people who are technocrats, bureaucrats, who are able to get out, and administrators who are able to effectively administer government. I think that we've had a a blurring of the lines there where you've seen far too many political appointments made into the, uh, the, the administrative side of the state and it has hollowed it out, which is why we have a home affairs department where it takes months to get even the most basic document, where you have government departments that are unresponsive, unable to do, to do their jobs. I think that, uh, that there, there's always a space in politics for political appointments but the line must be drawn very, very distinctly that these are not people who then are making the decisions around the administration and responsible for ensuring effective implementation 
of uh, the mandates of the various spheres of government. Well, even if they're not direct political appointees, they may be politically aligned, Mr. Stian Hazen. And, 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 and well, hence I say that the, the problem isn't per se the issue of cadre deployment. It's about deploying the correct cadres into the correct positions if need be. Look, everybody is entitled to belong to a political organization of their choice. The point I'm making here is that cadre deployment has hollowed out the state and it has turned it into an inefficient bureaucracy that costs the South African uh, taxpayers a huge amount of money every year. The huge amount of money we spend on a bloated, inefficient civil service is crowding out the social spend in South Africa where we could be ensuring we're, like we've been able to do over this last year, providing ongoing relief in terms of uh, grant, uh, social grant funding. It's crowding out housing delivery. It's crowding out all sorts of other things. It wouldn't be such a bad thing if it was efficient. The problem is it is bloated and inefficient precisely because you've had cadre deployment taking place as an official policy of this government over the course of, uh, a, year, of a number of years. South African SABC, which we were on this morning, is a good example. Shladi Motsuning was an excellent example of how cadre deployment actually ended up harming the state public broadcaster. I, don't, I think no better example exists of that. Many of the problems that the SABC faces today are precisely because someone like Mr. Motswaneng was put into a position that he was not suitable for and has uh, put the state broadcaster uh, into a very, very difficult position. That is a very, very good example of how cadre deployment hollows out the state and brings in inefficiency. Uh, talking about a bloated um, civil service, in terms of your views on that and setting an example, is it possible uh, for the Western Cape Run uh, DA, for example, to actually lead the charge on this and say, we feel that we are bloated and therefore we will do away or we will not appoint people in certain positions just to show by example that you believe that the state could be trimmed down? Not only is that the intention, it has already been begun by Premier Alan Windy who has an excellent and comprehensive plan about how to trim down the size of the civil service in the Western Cape to make sure that the money is being spent where it's needed the most, not on civil servant salaries, but on providing effective service and delivery and improving the lives of the citizens, the people of South Africa. I'm very excited about uh, what has been done already, but he's already started to implement uh, cost-saving measures, efficiencies, uh, processes that ensure that uh, government processes can be done uh, in different ways. We don't need hundreds of people doing a particular job, outsourcing. There's all these options that are available. And uh, I think the Western Cape certainly is leading the way in terms of showing how we can have a capable state that is lean and efficient and focuses absolutely on service delivery rather than on lining the pockets and ensuring you provide employment for a large batch of civil servants. So does the Western Cape actually have fewer um, uh, people in certain positions than the national average as opposed to what's happening in other ANC-run uh, provinces? Is that what you're saying, Mr. Stianazen? Yes, without a doubt. And the Premier has got a brand new action plan uh, to be able to trim down the size of the civil service and bring efficiency and effectiveness to that administration. The public sector wage bill is one of the huge problems which international rating agencies as well as credit rating uh, organizations as well as local economists will tell you is unsustainable. It is the elephant in the room that government seems unable to address for fear of political repercussions. But the huge amounts of every single rand that is raised in tax revenue is being spent on a bureaucratic inefficient civil service rather than on the people of South Africa where it is needed the most. Your political appointees, for example, in municipalities, have they actually refused to take those increases that they've been offered while other um, frontline workers have not been offered the same increases and uh, they've been asked uh, and talks about a wage freeze for them? Have DA members refused to take those increases? Well, of course, if there, are, if there is a, a public sector wage freeze, it applies to every civil servant in the country. And the DA will obviously have to be bound by whatever 
decision is made uh, by the, the national uh, structures that make up these decisions. I'm asking uh, a different the, question, Mr. Stienes, and I'm asking about political appointees because you, we've all been, and you mentioned it now again, talking about this balloon, uh, a ballooning wage bill, and yet we saw uh, political appointees, councillors in municipalities getting wage increases. If you're so concerned about that runaway wage bill, why did your councillors in the DA not object to those increases? I think you're, you're confusing two completely different things. Councillors are not appointees. They are public representatives. Uh, they're appointed by the people of South Africa. I was talking to you specifically around the public service, which is a distinctly separate operation. Councillors' salaries are determined at a national level through government gazettes, and it's up to each municipality to be able to decide whether it accepts I'm fully aware of that, Mr. Steenhuizen. In the end, it all adds up to that huge public sector wage bill in the end. All of it ultimately adds up. And, and I'm simply asking a moral question of you. If we are so concerned about these runaway wage bills in all spheres, all sectors of the public service, why did your members not object to taking those increases, especially in light of um, uh, government expecting frontline workers not to take an increase? But again, you know, you, you're conflating the two. When I've been talking about the public sector wage bill, it refers to specifically to public servants, not to public representatives. Members of parliament have had not had a salary increase for the last number of years. There have been a number of years where there has been a zero increase. That is because we don't determine our own salaries. They're determined by an independent remuneration commission that determines what they are. President then has to sign off on that. You know, so I, I think that there's two completely different issues here. There's the public sector wage bill, which, re, which talks about civil servants who, over the last number of years, have received massive hyperinflation increases of 7 to 8%. I think that, you're, that, that we mustn't confuse the public representative section of of, uh, of the of, of the equation. Hence, where, I so, said ultimately it'll, it all adds up into that huge pot at the end of these wages that are being paid by the state, Mr. Stienazen. Uh, but but I, I don't have a question then, because are you asking me whether? whether I've not taken a salary increase. No, I wasn't asking you. I specifically referred to councillors, and I asked on a moral question why your councillors didn't object, whereas they know that there is a, a, a public sector wage freeze being asked of the frontline workers to be taken. Uh, so it, it, it's just a matter of saying, you know, we can talk about all these runaway costs, but, but, but surely we also need to look into the mirror in terms of how we all are adding up to this particular wage bill. Of course we have to look into the mirror, and there's a number of ways in which... Uh savings could be made. I mean, one of them could be to stop bailing out the SABC every year because they're inefficient and ineffective and cannot even uh, steward, be stewards of their own finances. Uh, huge amounts of money, hundreds of millions of rands, have been wasted by the SABC. TV license fees that have been brought in by citizens around the country uh, and paid over have disappeared. We still don't know or have an answer what happened to those millions of rands. I think you're talking here about, you know, a couple of million rand where, in fact, what we should be doing is focusing on where the big money is being lost. The 16 billion rand bailout to South African Airways, the continued bailout of the SABC that cannot get its house in order, the continued bailout of Danel. That's where the big money lies. The VIP protection bill for, uh, politi for politicians at a national level, uh, the huge amount of money that is wasted every single year on uh, cars for ministers. That's where the big ticket items are. I think focusing on a, a 1% or 2% increase at a municipal level for councillors uh, is, is not where the, the real problem lies. And I accept we it, all have to... It, it is that. part of the problem, Mr. Stiernes, and whether we're talking about 10 rand, a million rand, a billion rand, it all adds up.
in the end. Uh, in the end. So I, I don't think it should be an either or question. You're absolutely right about all state owned enterprises and the wastage that's happening there. But equally, we cannot turn a blind eye to a few million rands going uh, miss in some municipality because that is why these municipalities are bankrupt, uh, because we take our eye off the ball, I would suggest. Municipalities are bankrupt because there's financial mismanagement in those municipalities and funds are misappropriated because you don't have clean, effective and accountable government. And that is the big difference. The DA-run municipalities are clean, we get clean audits every single year from the Auditor General. The Western Cape government has the cleanest and most accountable record precisely because we look after every rand of public money. And that's not by the DA's propaganda machine uh, with respect. That is from the Auditor General. And the last local government and provincial government uh, results would show you very clearly that wherever we govern, <laughs> there is clean, accountable government that focuses on making sure that every single rand of public money is accounted for and spent where it should be. The same can't be said about institutions like the SABC, who make a huge loss every single year, where huge amounts of money go missing every single year, and no one is ever held accountable. And I think that's where we should be focusing our efforts on, ensuring that we have clean and accountable government, both within the public sector and at a local government level. Uh, we're running out of time fast, Mr. Stienes, and I, I want to ask you about some more of those resolutions that came out of your Congress this weekend. Uh, structural changes that would give rise to a self-sustainable uh, job creation initiative. Um, I want to talk about that. Uh, you mentioned uh, poverty and uh, unemployment earlier on. And also, um, uh, many suggesting that the sooner we move away from racial thinking, the better and the swifter will we implement the principle of non-racialism as well one of the other resolutions that came out of your Congress. Let's speak to those two quickly. Well, I think that what we've got to realize is that the race-based empowerment that this government has embarked upon for the last two decades has been neither broad-based or empowering. Black South African households are poorer now than they were 10 years ago. Unemployment has jumped from around about 3 million to 13 million. Uh, and clearly you've seen a ultimate insider-outsider economy created where you have a small elite group of people who keep being empowered time after time, generally politically connected, and they're the insiders. On the outside of 30 million South Africans, 99.7% of whom are black South Africans, who are locked out of opportunity and trapped in poverty. Our plan is to break down the use of race-based policies as a means to keep empowering the same small group of elite and focus every bit of empowerment that government has on the people who need it the most, the 30 million South Africans who are living in poverty, those South Africans who don't have a job, those young people who are not able to get a start in life precisely because they're locked out of opportunity by an insider system. Best example of how these race-based policies are used to continuously enrich a small elite is what we've seen during the COVID corruption. It's the same people over and over again. It's the Mokanyanes, it's the uh, families of connected uh, ANC politicians who benefit. And it is the 30 million South Africans who are pushed out and excluded time and time again. Our policy focus is going to speak directly to those poor South Africans. We want to empower them rather than to keep making billionaires and millionaires through the fig leaf that is triple B double E. We have to have empowerment policies in South Africa. We have to address the imbalances of the past, and we've got to deal with inequality. We don't do that by using policies that just create and entrench even more inequality and cut more people out of opportunity. Mr. Sienhuizen, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much and uh, hope to speak to you more. Of course, we're going into an election year and uh, that's where we're going to leave it for this morning. Uh, this is the newly elected federal leader of the Democratic Alliance, John Sienhuizen, talking to us about his new position and, of course, the way forward for the Democratic Alliance.